Okay, so let me start, I think, on your platform. Okay, so let me start. So, so thanks for coming to this uh, mini course on professional high dimensions. And uh, in each lecture in this mini course, uh, except for first introductory lecture, we discuss some uh, technique in, uh, in convex geometry, which is useful for the study of uh, uniform errors in high dimensional convex sets. And we studied so far um, convex localizations, hyperplane plane resections, and, and optimal transport. And we had a few applications. We had uh, the Poincare inequality with the Payne Weinberger constant. We had um, Gomov's wave inequality, uh, uh, reverse hyperplane inequality for polynomials, and uh, reverse Figgs inequality. I think that's basically uh, all. And today we're going to discuss a, a method that was borrowed from uh, Riemannian geometry, uh, the Bochner technique, um, that goes back to the work of Solomon Bochner in the 1940s with many subsequent developments, at least in the 50s and, and so on. And uh, the rough idea is that, um, okay, let me just tell you, it sounds a bit vague, but then we'll see example. So the rough idea is that you can uh, make some local computations and, and, and commute some differential operators, and then some curvature term uh, arises, um, and then you use some integration by parts and, and and dualize them, you get some Poincare type inequalities. Okay, this sounds uh, pretty vague, but, but, but let's see how it works in, 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 in example. So we have uh, mu, which is a low concave measure in our end. Um, its density would be um, equal to minus psi, and it would be convenient to assume that psi is smooth in all of our n. It's not a big deal, it's, you can approximate by that and get it. And, and low concave means that the Hessian of psi is, is non-negative definite at any point. And our idea is that we're going to um, um, use uh, Euclidean distances, but we're going to measure volumes using the measure mu. So in other words, ah, that's exactly the body that I don't want to write on, okay volumes using mu. So in other words, um, people say that we, we work we in a weighted Riemannian manifold or metric measure space or a measure metric space, which is the space is Rn. This Euclidean metric, so I don't, this is the Euclidean metric for, for us. But the measure is not, the, you don't take the induced measure from this uh, metric, which is the Lebesgue measure, but you take mu. So you always measure uh, volumes with respect to mu, you only integrate with respect to mu. So what does it mean that I do this thing? So for example, what's the Dirichlet energy of a smooth function? Um, Dirichlet energy is integral of grad f square. Um, so what would it, what, what, what should it be? Um, well, it should be the integral of grad f square on Rn, but you integrate with respect to mu. Okay, so this is the, the gradient and the length are Euclidean, okay, Euclidean lengths. But this, this, I mean, you measure volumes with respect to mu. And I think that basically all integrals today would be with respect to, to, to the measure mu. Okay, so this is the Dirichlet energy. Square. Okay, um, what else do you have uh, with um, weighted Riemannian manifold or measure metric space? There is an associated Laplace operator, um, which is sometimes called Langevin operator or Fokker Planck. Let's call it Laplace type operator. Um, so it is defined uh, for smooth, let's make it compactly supported for now, although I've used this definition for smooth functions without one supported. So this is L of u, which has this specific formula. We'll explain why it's this formula in a second. So uh, psi is e to minus psi. So it's grad u times grad psi. It's a minus sign. 
And what's the reason why? Why do you call this operator the task type operator? This is because uh, um, the following iteration may pass. So if you have uh, two smooth functions, uh, one of them completely supported, uh, smooth, and, and say one completely supported, um, then uh, if you integrate grad u, grad v, this uh, Dirichlet pairing of, of, of these two functions, then this, then, then it's like, um, okay, so this function is also e to the psi, uh, the divergent, so I, I'm taking grad u, e to minus psi, diver divergence of that, and then multiply by e to the psi. That's, that's another way to, 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 to write this formula. And since this is e to the minus psi, then you see that you can, when you indicate by parts, you'd get uh, um, the divergence of that. So, okay, so this would be minus of the integral of u Laplacian v du, or, well, so it's um, essentially place a joint. So it's like that. Okay, so that's, that's the operator that corresponds to this little form. And as I just said to myself very quietly, this, it is essentially self-adjoint if it is initially defined on this uh, complex support smooth function. But I don't think we need any or almost any function I have to operate to the real. So, okay, so we just use this, this definition. Okay, so I said that the Bochner technique, any questions about, so this is the structure, you have this thing, you have the, the, uh, this operator, it has this integration by parts formula. That's, that's the setup. And then, um, then we want to, to commute things and get some curvature term, right? So, um, so we want to compute the Laplacian and the, uh, and the, the, um, and the gradients. So, um, so commutation leads to some curvature term. So there's a minus sign, that's what I wanted to check. Um, so if I look, if I have some smooth function, I look at the gradient of L of u. So I want to commute the Laplacian with the gradient operator. Okay, so what, what is going to be? So let me write it, so, so L of u is, is Laplacian u minus grad u grad psi. So we'll take the gradient of, let's say just take the derivative of that thing. So the derivative can hit the u functions here and here. And when it hit the u functions, what you're going to get is basically just L of the derivative of u. There will be some other term, but when it, the derivative is the u function, you just get L of the uh, uh, derivative of u. And in vector valued notation, that rate just L of grad u, this term. Okay, so this, this just acts coordinate-wise. Coordinate by coordinate. So I'm allow L to act on each coordinate separately. But, but, by the Leibniz rule, the derivative sometimes have to act on this term too. And if you act on e this term, we're going to do it a minus sign. Okay, that's minus sign. I'm going to do it the Hessian of psi times grad u. Okay, so we view this term as a curvature term, a bit like the Ricci curvatures that you get in, in Riemannian geometry. Okay, so we committed to go some term. Why is it, what is it good for? So we can now um, get the, the Bochner formula, stand up. Um, let's call it the integrated Bochner formula. which says the following. So we have, um, um, so for any um, smooth complex support function u, the following holds. So I have some strange looking formula if you never saw it. So I look at integral of a u squared, it's equal to the sum of two terms, and both are non-negative. That's the nice thing about it in the local concave case. So I get the Hessian term plus Hessian of psi grad u, grad u, the mu. So this is positive by low concavity because Hessian of psi is a matrix which is non-negative definite, and that's positive just by, so, ah, what is this term? So this term is, is uh, the sum of um, 
I draw it this way. It's the sum of the gradient of del a u square. It's also the sum of all second derivatives squared. Okay, so let's let us prove this. Um, let's prove this this proposition. And then we're going to dualize it. Okay, so that this is the scheme. Um, so, so we have the integral of L u square. Um, so this is L u times L u. So I can integrate by parts the L. So it is minus grad L u grad u. L u mu. Now, it would be nice to uh, commute these two trends. So if when I commute, what do I get? I'll get L of grad u grad u. So this is vector valid notation. Maybe I should, um, okay. But this, this notation could be, so this means that this is the sum of, of L of the, the i's derivative times the i derivative. That's what, what, this is what it is, right? Vector valid. Plus the Ritchie, plus the curvature term, plus the Hessian term. Um, grad u, grad u. Very good, and that thing um, is what we wanted because we, this, this has a minus sign. So if I integrate by parts, I get the Bochner sign. Okay. So this, this equals, so now if I, if I move the L here, I'm going to, let's look at this way. If I move the L here, I'm going to get grad of this thing times itself, sum over i. So this is exact, okay, let me do it. So this is grad del a u square plus, okay, I don't touch the other term. Okay. So that's the Bochner formula, in the integrate Bochner formula. Very good. Now, as I said, okay, any, any questions about this formula? Um, in, so, so there is a conjecture called the Kalis conjecture, Kanatlov Simonovich conjecture. This conjecture states that if uh, the measure is isotropic, then there is a spectral gap for L. So then there is uh, a gap between zero and L. If the measure mu decays super exponentially, the spectrum of L is discrete, but it can be continuous in some cases. You can get the hydrogen atom is one example, which is in a, in a continuous spectrum. Um, okay. You can operate. Um, okay, more questions? No. Yeah, but what, one important, very good, one important example, yeah, yeah. It, it, so if, if you use the Gaussian measure, thank you, yeah, then, then L is Laplacian U. That's an example, very good, thank you. This is, this is, this is the, the Austin Olympic, uh, the, yeah, that's an example of, of, of this general scheme for the Gaussian case, yes. And, and we will see that the Gaussian plays a role in this, in this analysis, thank you. Um, okay, so, so what I want to do now is to try to dualize, and there are two ways, okay, and basically there are two, there are two terms, both of them are positive, and there are, um, okay, so we'll see that there are two games to play, one of them will deal to one inequality, one will deal to another inequality, depending which term we, we, we get rid of. But first of all, the idea is, 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 is as follows. So we're given some function f in L2. So we want to bound the variance of some given function f. And it will be very useful to, to, to present f as L of u for some, some function u. Okay, I want, I want this term to be the variance of f, so I need to solve. Okay, so to, for dualization, we need to solve Um, given some function L, f in L2, we need to solve L u equals f. We need to find the u so that L of u equals f. This is not always possible. And let me, so I want to, I want to take, I will not, yeah, my, my goal in this lecture is never to take functions which are not in, in, in the, in the uh, core of the operator, the complex reported in function. Okay, so I want to solve u with this, with this function, but there is an, Ignore the smooth and complex support. There is a necessary condition which is pretty important, which is that the integral of f has to be zero. Why is that? 
because if f is L of u, integral of L of u um, times 1 is the integral of u times L of 1, and L is differential operator without constant term. So this is, this is 0. So that's a necessary condition that the integral of f has to be 0. And it turns out that pretty much that's it. So the claim is that the image under L of all smooth functions from which supported is at least dense in L percent in the space of all such functions. Okay. So that's in, in, in L two right, L percent. Okay, so let's uh, prove this. So I'll prove this modulo one fact that the uh, weak solutions of elliptic equations are smooth. But up to that fact, yeah, we can prove it. Um, uh, okay. So how would you prove that, that you can solve this equation at least in some, uh, in almost solve it for any given f? If, okay, so take something orthogonal to, to the subspace H, and let's show that it has to be constant. That's our, this is enough, right? It's Hilbert space, so to show that you are dense in the subspace, you need to show the orthogonal complement is zero, or in this case, a one dimensional function, the constant function. Okay, so let's pick a function L2, norm one. Such that F is orthogonal to LU for any, for any U compact group other than smooth. And our goal is to show that it's constant. If we know, show that it's constant, it means that then, then, then it's dense in H. Okay. So suppose first that F is smooth. Okay, that's the part that I'm going to, okay. But if we suppose that F is, is, is smooth, not complex, but just smooth, then we claim that it's in the kernel of L. Why? Because if you multiply by, okay, thank you. If you multiply by some bump function, uh, so if you multiply by some bump function, um, and you integrate LF with respect to this bump function, then, th then this is, um, okay, D mu then this is uh, LUF, but as we said, F is a total reason, so this is zero. Okay, so if F is smooth, it is in the kernel of L, okay? Um, however, in general, what's written here is that basically that, that F is a weak solution um, so F is a weak solution of, of, of this equation in, 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 in the sense of integration again. Um, so F is a weak solution of LF equals zero uh, in some sense. I mean, integration against seeing this function. And this is a elliptic equation. So L, where is L? Here is L. First, I mean, Laplacian minus some first order term. So this is a elliptic equation. Um, So it is a classical solution. So F is smooth and a classical solution. So we know that L of F equals zero. Okay. Now from that it follows. Uh, so the fact that L of F equals zero, and this implies that if you take uh, any complex of smooth function, there is a little, I mean, okay, right. So this is true. So there is some identity. This is the integral of grad u square times f square. Um, integration d, d, d mu. Um, okay, this is just, I mean, what do we have? We just have, uh, I mean, it must be, I mean, after you say that, it shouldn't be that hard to prove. Um, okay, so let's. Uh, let's explain that. So, uh, 
So the integral of grad u s square uh, is the minus L of u f times u f. And there is a, uh, you know, L of, okay, there is, I didn't say that, but there is a formula for L of a product. L of a product is L u f plus u l f plus twice grad u grad f. This is true for the Laplacian, it's true for also for this associated Laplacian operator with respect to, this is just true. And one of these terms is not with us anymore because LF is zero. So what you get is that this is a minus of the integral of, um, so U L U S square. I, I, I feel that I'm going to screw it up, um, but okay, let's see. Uh, so grad U grad F, F U. So it's like grad u square, grad f square, but that make it one half. And uh, and then I want to, to, to move this here. So it would be uh, um, minus u l u f square minus one half uh, l u square square f square, and this is twice u l u plus twice grad u square, but I got the sign wrong somehow. So this, this cancels with that, which we're happy. Uh, no, somehow I got the sign wrong. Let's see, grad u square, then I'm going to get a minus, grad u f, grad u f, this is the grad u f minus, and here, still with a minus, um, and here this throws with a minus, very good. This throws everything with a minus, so this is a plus. So this cancels with that and I get what, and yeah, so you get exactly what you said. Okay, good for us. Okay, well, okay. Uh, then what do you do? You just take some bump function and you say that, um, why is f a constant? So pick some epsilon. Uh, and pick some function, smooth function, which equals one on some ball, and and does not grow. I mean, and very slowly, slowly, slowly. So this this thing at infinity. Then the, the the integral of grad f on this ball, or integrals with respect to mu, which is at most the integral of grad u f square because mu is one on, the, on some neighborhood of that ball. And, and this is the integral of on our n, and that's the integral of grad u square f square, and this is more than epsilon square. So, um, so this is more than epsilon square, which goes to zero. So this means that grad f is zero, and f is constant, so we can have uh, uh, um, this solution. Okay, this, this finishes this lemma. Um, and now let's see one way. So there are two ways to dualize the Bochner formula. Let me write it again. So Bochner formula tells us that integral of LU square is the sum of two strings, the Hessian, this thing and that thing. It's the same as in the Riemannian geometry. If you're familiar with that, then I mean, you just put the Ricci. That's the same formula in the Riemannian manifold. Now, if so, you can both of them are on positive. If I get rid of this thing, I'm going to get brass complete inequality, which I'll do now. And if I get rid of this term, I get so-called H minus one inequality, which I'll do afterwards. Okay, so let's begin with brass complete. So, so this is inequality from the 70s. So let's see how, how do you dualize this, uh, this um, Bochner formula identity. So first of all, it would be slightly convenient to assume, it's, it's a technique, I don't, so uh, you know, psi, uh, we know that it's no negative if you are concrete, but let's assume that it's strictly positive, just to avoid some questions. It's not, just smooth a bit and it's correct. So probably the tiny Gaussian, you have that, it's, it's nothing. Um, then the claim is that for any, uh, F in L2, if it's smooth, T1 smooth is enough, 
then its variance, okay, finally we have a low upper bound for the variance, concrete inequality, is smaller than the integral of the inverse Hessian, so that's the important thing, the inverse Hessian of psi grad f grad f. So it's like a, Poinc it's like a weighted Poincaré inequality, okay? And, and, and the weight is the, the inverse of the Hessian of, of, of the potential, of the log of the potential. So this is the basket of inequality. Um, there's an equality case if f equals grad psi times some fixed vector theta. You have equality there, so there's an n-dimensional eigenspace. If you, I mean, okay, well, let's not discuss this directly form, but there is an n-dimensional space of, of, of equality cases. And, and we'll explain after the proof why it is actually booming cops or per lander in some disguise. And we'll see application. Okay, so let's let's prove bus complete. Okay. So true. Um, so variance, you know, it's uh, integral of f square minus uh, integral of f square, right? That's variance. So let's assume that uh, the integral is zero. You add the constant and nothing happens. Okay, and then we know we can solve LU equals F, right? That's what we wanted. So let's almost solve, almost, not exactly solve. So let's pick some epsilon. Then by the lemma there exists some smooth function which almost solves uh, LU equals F. So this is, is, is smaller than epsilon. Okay, then um, let's look at, at the variance. I mean, okay, the, the integral of the, um, yeah, the, 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 the variance of F or the, okay, it's the L2 norm just. Um, so I want to replace F by UF, so I, 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 okay, this will be the error, LU minus F. So this is actually the less important uh, thing here. And then I need to correct it, so I need to add twice LU times F. And to subtract LU square. Right, that's, okay, what can I say about this thing? So this, as I said, this is nothing. Um, this thing will integrate by parts because U is um, smooth and F is C1 smooth, so it's okay. It's completely kosher. Um, I should ask this evening the Chabad person, okay, but I think it's kosher, okay. Um, grad U, grad F, the new. Okay, the, the just F is, okay. The, and what would I do with this term? So all we said is that, well, we have, we want to dualize the Bochner formula. Okay, um, and I said that bus can flip, you ignore this term, so this is at least, because of this at least, this term. Okay, so if it's with the minus, is at most, Hessian of psi grad u grad u. Okay. Okay, now we all look at these things. You have, so if this is some vector x and this is some vector y, this is a matrix A. So we can use the, the cauchy schwarz inequality. It tells you that if you have positive definite matrix just for its A for a second, then this is at most A x x um, uh, twice here plus A minus one y y, right? That's just, Completing a square, That's, this is true for any x, y, now, n, and some matrix A, which is positive, definite, right? Um, so it means that if I continue here, so minus two x, y plus this thing would be at most, with a plus sign, the inverse matrix, grad f, grad f, right? That's what you get, and, and, and well, epsilon goes to zero, uh, okay, then it's what you want. Okay, so that's the Basque complete inequality, and it's true 
um, under low gravity assumption, let me remark that it's indeed uh, Bominkovsky in a disguise. Um, So it's an, it, it, seems this is, it is an infinitesimal version, infinitesimal version of um, Bominikovsky, actually Prekopalein law, which I mentioned in, I think, all of these lectures. But let me think once again. So what is Prekopalein law, if you don't remember? Um, so, um, it, so first of all, it's a functional version of Bominikovsky inequality. And it says that uh, if um, you have two, um, rho zero and rho one are low concave, then you can have them in Nikovsky sum, or Nikovsky sum for function is subconvolutions. And you take some p between zero and one, then the interpolant, the, 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 the signal corresponds to one minus t k plus t l, the, the, the Nikovsky average, is the following uh, operation. So you take all, all ways to the compose x as one over minus t y plus t z, and you take this rho zero y to the y minus t and so y z to the t. And Prekopalender tells you that the integral of rho t, let's say the log of that is concave in p. Uh, and if you differentiate y, so brass can play is, is if you, uh, uh, if the fact that the second derivative in t is, 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 is negative, that's exactly the brass can play matrix. Okay, um, let's see some, any questions about anything? So let's see some applications of the uh, Baskin Flavor inequality. Um, and then we'll switch to the H minus one inequality. So, okay, so this is some application. So, so um, um, sorry, it's corollary one. <laughs> assume that mu log of a probability measure is not just log concave, but is actually more log concave than the standard Gaussian. I think we discussed that, but let me remind you. So, so You came late, right? Did, did you, yeah, you're here from the beginning? You can fill up, yes, 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 absolutely, yes. You, 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 you need to compensate for the time you missed. Right, please, exactly, yes, okay. From where to where, from this? Ah, that's just this 10th, so I just took a, so it's. Yeah, 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 so minus two, okay, it's a minus x. Minus, it's the same, minus two x y minus a x x is smaller than a y y. That's what we use for any point was inequality. That follows, it, yeah, you, it is something like square root of a x minus square root of a minus one y is positive. And open the bracket and that's what we get. Okay, that's, that's, that's a linear algebra inequality. This, yes, yeah, like the fact that I is, is, no, yeah, is this one, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, but it's hard to use it. So basically what, I mean, okay, yeah, there are some mixed equality, but they look not so elegant. There are two things that are reasonably elegant, which is, so this term or so that term. <laughs> These two things have clear applications. Uh, um, yeah, but the mixture, yeah, right, you can write something for sure, right? I mean, there is some, but yeah, it does not seem super relevant. Um, more questions? So what's more low than the Gaussian measure? Right, first let's draw a picture. If this is the Gaussian, if you are more concave, then you should be mm, like this, right? More, more picked, kind of. Um, get the definition. No, uh, if you remember, so what we said is that if this is e to minus c, uh, I, okay, I think I, there are many ways to do it. So, 
um, this means that if I multiply the density by, I divide by the Gaussian density, mu over, uh, if, if I, okay, if I multiply, divide by the Gaussian density, it's still low concave. Um, or equivalently, um, if d mu of dx is e to minus psi, then not only the Hessian of psi is no negative like you are used to, no, 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 we require much more, we require uniform lower bound, which in this case is identity, one. This is the meaning of being low, more low concave than of Gaussian. Okay, so this is the assumption, and then the conclusion is that the Poincaré constant, the spectral gap, is at least one, that's the spectral gap. Okay, I think we almost proved it by spelling out what it means, but, but let's, let's write it down. Um, so, the proof. Uh, okay, as we said, the Hessian is, is, is positive, is at least one. So it means that the inverse Hessian is the smallest one. That's it, and then we are done. So by Brask and Plead, for any smooth, uh, C1 smooth, local elliptic is fine, but we did it in some case. Function A2, its variance is smooth, the integral of Hessian minus one, which is smallest one, this is smallest one, so yeah. Okay, so that's a point of inequality of constant one, so spectral gap is one. Good. Um, let me just say in comparison, so we had um, quite, we had some bounds for lambda mu. The first bound you mentioned is from the 19th century due to Poincaré, and the best constant was found later by Payne Weinberger. The Payne Weinberger inequality was optimal in a very degenerate situation for the, it was about the, the diameter. It was lambda mu is at least some constant over the diameter square. This was the Payne Weinberger. And that one was optimal only in very um, degenerate situations where you're almost one dimensional. So that one, I would say, is not always useful in high dimension for reasonable distributions. In comparison, this one is, is not that bad. For instance, it's tight for the Gaussian. For the Gaussian measure, lambda mu equals one. So, and if you're not that far from the Gaussian, it's, it's reasonable inequality. However, it requires, um, it requires uniform bounds, right? I mean, this, this corollary needs uniform low concavity. I want to know that the Hessian is always at least something. Uh, and um, the Kellett's conjecture that is only solved after logarithmic factors. So what it says that you can get away with some average quantity. So it doesn't need some uniform uh, uh, low concavity, but somehow, if we integrate something, th th then, then, then it's good enough, okay? By the way, the integral of the Hessian of Psi is the Fischer information, okay. So that's, anyway, yeah. So, so that's the simplest thing when you have uniform low concavity. Okay, uh, for the second application, let me, uh, it's a simple definition, but okay. So, so function. Yeah, KLS tells you that, 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 that if you know that the integral of uh, x i x j d mu x is delta i j and the integral of x i d. So if you, have, if you have some normalization conditions, then lambda mu is at least a constant. This is not known, that's a conjecture. It's known up to some log factor. That's the, that's the KLS conjecture. But no, it, with this normalization. That's the question. Um, okay, so for so definition, um, some function psi, well, this um, is invariant under current reflections. Okay, um, so there is a, a misnomer which is very popular, unfortunately, and I'm going to use it for sure. So it's called unconditional in this business for some reasons which are irrelevant, okay. But being valid on reflections means that uh, psi of some vector 
does not depend on the size of the coordinates. So if you change the signs, if you put plus minus, then it's the same. Or if you put absolute values, maybe it's better to argue this way. Okay, so that's, that's, um, this is uh, uh, unconditional. And, um, and, and this is, so if psi is more over convex, Um, and unconditional, it means that it has this re coin with symmetries, right? So it looks in each, if you fix all coins except for one, there is a convex even function, um, which means that it's increasing, at least in the orthant. If you're restricted to the orthant, then it's increasing in all coordinates. Non, non not increasing in all coordinates. That's easy, and and okay. Let me give you just I mean, okay. Little exercise is to show that in this case, um, the restriction uh, of psi to the orthant is so-called uh, is p convex uh, for p equals one half. Actually, for all p. Okay, never mind. So this, what does it mean? It means that. If I look at psi of x1 square xn square, this is convex. Okay, so this is some other, some type of conve uh, convexity. So it requires that after I square the coordinate, this is convex. Um, and and uh, play would imply the following. Corollary, the second corollary from Bas complete. So let um, u be a measure on the orthant. Uh, e to minus c is the density, uh, where psi is, um, say, p convex. Okay, just for p equals one half, it's not uh, so important. So for instance, if mu is low concave and unconditional, then, then that's one example. And conditional meaning invariant on the corner intersection. Then we have the following for Pancoria type inequality. And for any f in L2, which is C1 smooth, the variance of f is at most the following uh, expression involving, so it's kind of in place of the Hessian of psi, which is something we know very little about, you got some kind of diagonal matrix. So it's okay, potentially useful. Um, why, why is it, why is the color of bus complete? Basically, the idea is just to, to change coordinates and apply bus complete. What's the change of the coordinates? So we define pi just to be the, the, these squares. What will it be? Okay, so we have um, the measure mu here. And, and we have the map pi here, okay? So this is pi, so it means that I need to push forward, and so pi minus one. So, uh, uh, okay, let's denote nu to be the push forward of pi minus one. Okay, so this is nu, and d nu to dx is e to minus phi. Um, So what is phi? So this is push forward, so I, need, I know that phi of x, what will it be? I need to, first of all, to pull back under pi uh, the function psi, so psi composed with pi, which is very good for me because this is convex, right? This, this is the assumption, we are convex. 
And then I have the Jacobian term. The Jacobian term is, is the product of 2xi, but I have minus log of that. So it will be minus log minus log 2xi from 1 to n. OK, that's just by, by, by the change of variable formula. That's the, that's the measure mu. The nice thing is that not only phi is convex, not only mu is log concave, but it's, it's convex plus some convex term. OK? So if I compute the Hessian of phi, what will it be? The Hessian of phi, so this term is convex by assumption. I just get rid of it, get some lower bound. And what's the second derivative matrix of this function? First derivative, the two is nothing. First derivative, one over x minus one over x. I think it will be one over x i square. So this is the, 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 this is the matrix of second derivative. So the inverse is at most x1 square xn square. And th this means that by brass complete for any g, the variance with respect to nu of g is at most, um, um, sum, OK, the integral, the sum of xi square del ig x square d nu. Right, that's the Hessian grad, this is the Hessian of, that's Hessian minus one grad g grad g. OK, so, so g lives here. So here should be some function f, and, and g is the pullback of, g is the pullback of f. Right, so let's go back to, to the language of f, get the intensity of function, and we're going, going to get the factor of four. So g is, 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 is f composed with pi, OK? And if y is pi of x, then I think that um, x i there, if you differentiate this thing with g, then you're going to get, OK, twice, because it's x i square y i del i f. And, and so if you plug in this, this is the same as the variance of mu of, of f, because it's just uh, the same function under pi, and you'll get that thing. OK, so this proves that, that th th this inequality um, with this explicit formula. And, 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 uh, and the last corollary of brass camp lib okay, is, is that we can get um, optimal uh, thin shell uh, in the unconditional case. So so if you have, um, let me say x and not mu. So if f x is a low concave uh, isotropic and unconditional a random vector in Rn, Um, then we have good estimate for its thin shell. Let me, if you, so if you don't remember, so it was maybe two weeks ago, so let me remind you. So first of all, the conclusion is that the variance of x is smaller than some uh, constant, I think four, it's some, some universal constant, we'll see from the proof. Um, but why is it called thin shell? Why, is it, why are these things so important for us? Uh, first of all, this is something we don't like. I mean, if you believe it, the Keyless conjecture implies that this is not needed, right? I mean, um, but okay, this, this I think one of the few cases when we we, we have the optimal bound. Isotropic means that uh, some normalization. That is this is what it means here. Just something like that. And why why is it a good bound? What what what's 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 important about that? We know that the exponential of x i square equals one, so it means that. Uh, x squared, the Euclidean norm square is root of n. And we have reverse order inequality, so it means that, that also the, uh, the L1 norm is actually root of n. So it means that if I draw in Rn the distribution of x, well, then basically root of n is the scale where it lives. But what we learn from that bound on the variance of x is that there is a thin spherical shell.
So if this is root of n, here the width is a constant, just four or something. This is constant width. And we know that most of the mass of the distributions lies in this thin spherical shell. And, and if you remember, this related to the fact that you have a Gaussian approximation, good barrier syntax bounds. It is related to the case. I mean, this is part of the business that we discussed uh, in the other. So in that case, we can solve this. And relatively simply, right? I mean, we just did Bochner and some dualization. That's it. OK, so, so why is that true? Um, so x is unconditional, so we can use uh, I mean, so, the, so you can basically pass to the orthant everything. I mean, you know, to, since it's uh, invariant on reflection, you can just work on the orthant. So you can just uh, say that, um, okay, let me. So first of all, this is at most, we know that root of n is the, almost the expectation. So let's, let's write it this way. And, and uh, then there is this nice simple trick. You multiply by, the, by x plus root of n. So it's at most one over n expectation in the squares. Okay, that's so which is the variance of x square. And now let us use the previous corollary. So we restrict it to the orthant. It's unconditionally low concave. So in particular, it's p convex for p equals half. So we have that that inequality there. So we get this is by the uh, corollary number two. What will we get? One over n times the sum times four. Okay, not the sum. The sum of what? Expectation of x i squared. This is this factor. Times the derivative of the function. The function is x squared. So the derivative of the function would give us two x i squared. So what I get is sixteen over n. The sum of x i to the four. And at this point, we, we, we have the reverse Helder inequalities for polynomials due to Bourguin. Bourguin um, that we uh, discussed two weeks ago. So this is at most 16 over n. Not 16, some universal constants which we already don't follow. Uh, but I can replace the, the, the L4 norm by the square of the L2 norm. Right, ah, for the reverse, you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's much easier, thank you, yeah. That's way before Bourguin, right, right, right. Bourguin is, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, this goes back to Berval in the 40s, way before Borel even. That, that's much, right, right, thank you. Yeah, this is much, much simpler. This passage is much simpler than, than the reverse. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, this is a little bit of matter. Just one dimension, yeah, sure. That's from the 40s, yes. Anyway, this equals, this is one, so this just equals one. Okay, so this, this proves this uh, uh, corollary. Okay, and, 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 uh, Okay, um, so all, all of this was about the, the dualization where we get rid of one term. Now let me say something about the h minus y inequality where you uh, dualize the, the, the next term. And we'll, so you know, up to low, no, no, up to log. so this, so 15 years ago it gave KLS up to log in the unconditional case. This was, this I did in 209. But yeah, I think that's still the. This is true. This is true. This was so yeah right. So so for one condition right, the log is is here is with us for decades. But yeah, indeed it's still there. Still for, as far as I know, even in the case, you still have the log. Okay, right. Yeah, but things are improving. Um, yeah. Okay. So just say the inequality, and we'll see applications probably next class in two weeks because next week is Thanksgiving. Um, so I need to, uh, okay, so this was the, the this is the, the, Bochner, uh, the Bochner identity, which I think we all learn to love by this point of the lecture. Uh, and, and indeed it's very much, uh, can be generalized to many, many situations, really. I mean, Riemann geometry, it's, it's way, way above uh, the applications that I, 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 I show you here. Okay, now I want to, to get rid of this term. And just use that term and dualize that. So for that, I need a dual Sobolev norm. Uh, 
Okay, so what the dual trouble is now, so for, fu for function f in L2 of u, let's uh, define the h minus 1 norm of this function. So the dual trouble of norm, with respect to the L2 um, factor, is so the supplement of the integral of f u where we assume the integral of gradius squared, the h1 norm of u is smaller than at most 1. Uh, let's make u, as I promised, complex for smooth always. We don't have weak Sobolev spaces today, which is thing. Okay, that's the dual Sobolev norm. Uh, it makes sense only if the integral of f is 0, because if the integral of f is non-zero, it can take u, which is, uh, let me take without from the point. A smooth function. So if the integral of f is non-zero, it can take u, which is just a function one. And if the you take the function one, um, then uh, this is zero. So this is a legitimate uh, thing in the super room, and you'll get something. So it makes sense. Uh, so uh, makes sense only when I mean it's infinite unless unless you know that the integral of f d mu is zero. That's a requirement. And what's the interpretation of this Sobolev norm? This is optimal transport. So interpretation, in this case, where the average is zero, so the, 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 the Sobol, the H minus one norm of F, if you take very small epsilon, is the L to Wasserstein distance between mu and some perturbed version of mu. When you multiply mu by this thing, this is still a probability measure because f is integral one. Okay, so, and w2 is the rest of the, let me just remind you, we discussed it last week, that's the infimum of all couplings. Of all way to couple these two measures, and you want to minimize the, the average L2 distance that points travel. So I want to couple them so as to minimize the, the coupling. So that's, it's kind of some kind of transport distance. And the inequality, the transport for inequality tells us that um, 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 that the following is true. So um, u log concave f say in L2 mu is Simon smooth. Then the variance of, of f is at least something strange. So I'm going to take the derivative of the, the gradient of f and apply the h minus one norm to it. This, this is vector valued, so it's just a sum of the uh, h minus one norm of the derivative. So there is some interplay that you take a derivative by taking the minus one Sobolev norm here. Okay, and I think I improved it in, in, in one minute. So let me prove it. And this will be the last thing that we do today in applications uh, next class. Yeah, this is, this, yeah, this. This is, this is identity, it's just for, yeah, that's just. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, this, yeah, this is just. Sure, you, you can write a, you can, uh, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah. Grad F as a, yeah. Okay, so the proof should be, okay, I'll do the proof. Ah, it's do, uh, as a past complete, so proof. Uh, so may I assume integral of F equals zero. Uh, up to some epsilon, which I please let me, I will ignore that. So you can, F is roughly L of U, right? So let's assume F equals L of U and you guys can do deal with epsilon later. Then the integral of f square, right? That's the integral of also LU square, by the way, or LU times f. Let me put a minus, it's better. So that's uh, LU times uh, f, so it's like grad u times f, integration by parts. And this is pairing, so it is at most the h minus one norm of grad f. times the, the, the uh, um, h1 times the root of 
the integral of the h1 norm of, of grad u. If I do it vector valued, you can do it coordinate by coordinate if you want, and it's, maybe it's easier to understand. I do it vector valued. So it will be what? It will be the sum of the, the Hilbert Schmidt norm of the Hessian. This is what I get just by definition. This is just definition of h minus one norm. That's it. And the supremum of that thing. And by Bochner, finally, we know that this is this thing is at most that thing because this is positive. So that's grad f h minus one of u, the root of the integral of l u square v mu, and this cancels with one of the things here, and I get the inequality. Okay, so this finishes the proof of the h minus one inequality. Applications make quick, and and this is all I wanted to say. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions. The risk transform inequality? This is true. This is true. Yes. Ah, here I have the gradient of F. Right, 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 right. Not the F. I agree that there is, it looks similar, right? But I never thought of any, any. So, but that's, the resistance form is true up to some quantum. It has nothing to do with local concavity. I mean, does it have something to do with local concavity? Uh, that's a good question. I just, I. I mm -hmm. I'm interested. I, 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 ne I never, I never connected the resistance form equality. I, I, yeah, right. Here, this, here you have the, gra right. I, this is a very good question. I, let, let, let's discuss that. I just, I don't, uh, maybe. I don't know. Good question. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. So there are, first of all, there is an asymmetric Pascal Pib inequality. Yes. Um, yes. There are works about the decay of the Green's function. Right. 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 I can point you to some literature. Uh, but there are some works about the decay of the of the diagonal elements of the Green's function. Yes. Uh, th th these inequalities, as I said today, are, are kind of clean, like constant one or maybe four or two. That these things have some, co and these things are, like, if my, to my recollection, are not super clean. There are some, but yes, there are works. I give you some uh, uh, point, point or two literature. I don't remember exactly, the, you know, the, what the best result that they have. But yes, surely there are things about the green, green function. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's what I'm not sure. Exactly, that's what I, I don't, I'm not sure. But. The, I'm. You think that, yeah, I, I, I uh, right, but if you have ultra low concavity, um, um, that's like a body of knowledge that, yeah, I, I, yeah. Okay, and there was another question. Yeah. Right, this uniformity, right? I mean, the yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, that's the yeah, that's that's the thing about QLS. You don't want uniform, exactly. If you, you take a little, give a little, uh, touch a bit, uh, the uh, and it's not no, no uniform. It's still multiple point grain equality. There are some stability results, first of all. I mean, if you are total, if you are total variation half from, if if you know that this is uh, at most a half, then they have comparable lambdas up to inversal constant. So there are things that have this form. What, what? Maybe? I mean, you're talking about the point query. The point query, yeah. yeah. You have it. Ah, you're not low concave at all. So you, you want to invert, but what is the meaning of this term if you're not low concave? So this is not, this could be negative, right? So if you're in the support of the negative part, you, okay, I'm a bit worried. 
I mean, if you have like little bump here, then here the action is just negative. Never mind. But if you have a bump where, where this is negative, then you can have a bump function and the right hand side will be negative and the bump. I don't know. I mean, I, to work with a situation where the action is not is just negative, I, I look too many. I mean, uh, there are some integrate. Okay, there are things where you integrate. So okay, there are things where you can if you first integrate on fibers, and then you get log derivative, then, then it's good enough. So if you know that after integration it become become positive, then it's then th this thing is slow. But something in general, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, these are kind of research problems that you ask. I, I, I don't have quick like. Uh, um, okay. Okay, guys, thank you very much. See you next.